Do you want a message this morning or do you want your life changed forever? Which one? All right. Well, the Bible says you don't have because you don't ask. So can we ask for that? So let's pray. Father, in Jesus name, thank you. Thank you for the privilege of being your children. You could have made us slaves and that would have been amazing compared to where we were. But Lord, I'm asking this morning that you would literally invade this sanctuary, that you would reveal Jesus greater than we've ever known him before. As you do, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and give us a heart to perceive it and understand. And may this be a day that we will never, ever be the same again as a result of what you do. And I ask this in Jesus' mighty, wonderful, majestic, holy, awesome, magnificent name. And everybody that agrees shouts, Amen. come on, thank God for what he's going to do. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. This morning, I want to share with you something that's very, very passionate on my heart right now. It's quite amazing. It was in my heart to share this with you. And then Pastor Carl called my office and said, is there any way John could share on this? And my assistant said, well, he's already sent the resources and he's already told us this is what he's going to share on. I believe this is a now word for this church. I believe if you open your ears and you really listen this morning, you will never, ever be the same. Last year, I went on a fast. On this fast, I asked the Lord, what book of the Bible do you want me to read? That's kind of my custom when I'm going on a fast. He told me the book of Acts. And so as I read through the book of Acts, scripture started jumping up off the page. Literally, I mean, just bam, as many times as I read through it. And all those scriptures had to do with the exact same thing. And that is how much the early church looked to, depended on, spoke about, and interacted with the Holy Spirit. He was a vital part of their lives. He was preeminent in everything they did. And the more I prayed and read, the more I realized what was really common among them seems to be more uncommon with us today. Let me just make this statement. There is virtually no Christianity without the Holy Spirit. You remove the Holy Spirit from Christianity, it very quickly turns into a very dry, monotonous, mundane religion. You remove the Holy Spirit from a church and it will morph quickly into either a social club or a religious institution. So the very, very crucial thing that we've got to do is understand him as a person. See, I find the mistake of most people, most Christians, is when you mention Holy Spirit or they begin to research, they immediately go to his manifestations rather than understanding him as a person. Are you with me? We got to settle it. Is he a person, the third person of the Godhead, or is he just a powerful influence that emanates from the Father, kind of like what we would say the spirit of democracy or the spirit of generosity? Well, if you see the Holy Spirit as just a powerful influence, you'll make ridiculous statements such as, I'm a Holy Ghost person, or I want more of the Holy Spirit. But if you understand him to be the third person of the Godhead, then you will not make statements like, I want more of the Holy Spirit. You'll make statements like, how can I give myself more to him? You know, I think the problem really stems back to how we view him. I've been in ministry now over 30 years. If I had $1 for every time I've heard the Spirit of God referred to as an it, I would be one wealthy guy. But if you would just simply look at the scripture, you would realize that Romans 8, 27 says he has a mind of his own. He has a will, according to 1 Corinthians 12, 11. He has emotions. He comforts. He speaks. In fact, the Bible says he speaks clearly. He teaches. He can be grieved. He can be insulted, just like any person could be insulted. He can be resisted. He can be lied to. The problem really goes back to where we were raised in church. If, if some of you were raised in some kind of a church atmosphere with a Sunday school, how many of you remember, you know, every time you say the Holy Spirit, you just see this picture of a dove, okay? He is not a dove, okay? The Bible says in all four gospels that he descended upon Jesus like a dove. Now, you can have a guy that wins the state championship in weightlifting, and you can say he's strong like an ox, right? That doesn't make the guy a four-footed animal. It just means you're describing how strong he is. 
When it says in the Gospels, he descended upon Jesus like a dove, it's just saying the way he descended upon him. Are you with me? And so we have to understand he is a person and we actually were created in his image. And so the apostle Paul comes to the Corinthian church. He writes a couple letters telling them how to live effective Christian lives. It comes to the very end of the second letter. And the very last words he says to this church is, in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now what he's doing here with this scripture is he's highlighting each of the persons of the Godhead's roles in our life. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Now I wanna focus in on the final one. The communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Now, I was raised Catholic. I was an altar boy for eight years. When you say communion to me, I think about those little wafers and the wine I snuck when the service was over, okay? That's communion. But if you look at the Greek word, the Greek word is koinonia. This Greek word has three major definitions. Number one, fellowship. So what Paul is writing is, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Now notice he doesn't say, may the fellowship of Jesus be with you. Why doesn't he say that? Because Jesus isn't here. I mean, he went, he's a few billion miles away at the throne of God. When he went up to heaven, the angel said, the way he went is the way he's coming back. He hadn't come back that way yet. I mean, when Stephen was stoned, the heavens were open. He saw Jesus at the right hand of the Father. The person of the Godhead who's here is the Holy Spirit. That's why he says, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Notice the next word is partnership. Now listen to these words. May the partnership, I love this, of the Holy Spirit be with you. And the final one is may you be intimate with the Holy Spirit. Now let's talk about each each of these, all right? Number one, fellowship. The word fellowship, how is it defined? Now I want you to listen carefully. It means companionship or sharing together. Now, how many of you know companions share with one another? All right, I'm going to play golf this week with Pastor Rob. Wouldn't it be ridiculous if Pastor Rob and I were on a golf course for four hours and we didn't say anything to each other? I mean, Pastor Frank picked me up this morning at dark 30, okay? He was tired from the wedding last night. I was a little bit groggy-eyed from our late fun dinner last night, okay? But you know, as tired as we were, we still talked to one another on the way over. We talked about the services today, the football games that are gonna be going on. We talked about the wedding last night. So, and by the way, Denver will win. And come on, baby. Wow, I incited a riot. All right, so anyway, we're sitting here talking all the way over. Can you imagine if I got in the car and didn't say anything to him or he didn't say anything to me? Yet how many times do we get in the car, we'll drive all the way to Honolulu, 20 minutes, and we don't say one word to the Holy Spirit. I mean, I personally think he is the most ignored person in the church. If you ever feel like people ignore you, just talk to him, he really understands. But you see, the early church, they were having interaction with him. They were having companionship with him. If you look at the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul said in Acts 20, 22 and 23, and now I am going to Jerusalem. Now look at this, drawn there irresistibly by the Holy Spirit. Notice he didn't say I'm being drawn there irresistibly by Jesus. He said drawn there irresistibly by the Holy Spirit, not knowing what awaits me except the Holy Spirit has told me in city after city. The jail and suffering await for me. And do you understand there is like interaction going on between Paul and the Holy Spirit in the hotel rooms in Athens, in Thessalonica, in Corinth, city after city. They're talking about it. If you look at Philip, Philip is an evangelist. And you know, an entire community gets saved in his ministry. And Philip is right in the middle of this meeting and suddenly we read in Acts 8.26, now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Now, no translation does it say an angel appeared to Philip. Now I will tell you, there are other people that angels appeared to in the New Testament. Joseph, Mary, Zacharias, all right? 
Nowhere does it say an angel appeared to Philip. It said an angel spoke to him and said, go down to the desert. So Philip goes down to the desert and three, a few days later, he sees a royal Ethiopian chariot, chariot and in Acts 8, 29, it says, then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. Now, do you understand these guys knew the voice of the Holy Spirit so well, they could differentiate his voice from the voice of an angel. Okay, now, that's real, real weird to us. But is it really that strange? If I'm in a room and I'm talking to Pastor Carl and there's a couple dozen people in that room and my wife Lisa's on the other side of the room talking to Pastor Kanani and Lisa, let's say, says something kind of loud I'm looking at Carl. I'm not even looking at Lisa. Lisa hadn't appeared to me. I can't even see her. And I'll go, there's my wife. Because I know her voice so well. I can be in a grocery store. I hear her voice three aisles over. I say, there's my wife. You know, I got 30 employees in Colorado. I can call my office and I'll tell you exactly who it is that picks up that vo phone just by them saying, John Bevere, Men or excuse me, Messenger International. I know exactly who it is. So why is it so strange to us that they could tell the difference between the Holy Spirit's voice and an angel's voice? Do you understand that when, they, when, 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 when Dr. Luke is writing this book of Acts, Philip looks at him and goes, wait, wait, wait. It wasn't the Holy Spirit who spoke to me in the city of Samaria. It was, it was an angel. But I knew it was the Holy Spirit who spoke to me when I was out in that desert and said, join the chariot. See, remember I said what was common to them seems uncommon to us? Are you with me? Yeah. Partnership. Koinonia means partnership. Now listen to what Paul's saying. May the partnership of the Holy Spirit be with you. How many of you know partners develop a flow? You know, when people start partnering, it can be a little awkward. You know, I grew up in uh, Michigan, in the western part of the state, huge sailing. I had two years of sailing school. I raced, we had a yacht, our family. I remember the first time I got on a real good race boat. The skipper was good, he had a crew, and they, they brought me on as part of the crew. And you know, they told me what to do. They said, we're out in the race, and he gives this command, you do this, and you do that, and you do this. And they told me everything. We got out, and we got out there, I was the odd man out. Because everybody else was flying into action, and I'm awkward. Now they told me what to do, but I hadn't developed the flow yet. But after time, I was like everybody else. I remember when I played varsity tennis at Purdue University. I was paired up with the number two man. And you know, when we started playing doubles, we were partners, right? We were really awkward. There's balls getting between us. I'm thinking he's getting it. He's thinking I'm getting it. But after time, we get a flow going and we're unbeatable. We were really good. All right? And so that's what happens with us in our partnership with the Holy Spirit. I remember the first time my wife heard me preach after we were married 30 years ago, 31 years ago. Within five minutes of my message, she's on the front row. I hope you never do this to Pastor Carl. She's on the front row and she falls asleep and sleeps my entire message. And her best friend sitting next to her is so deep in sleep, she's got drool coming out of the side of her mouth and I'm watching it, okay? Now I don't put people to sleep. Why? I've learned how to flow with my partner. Are you with me? I mean, I talk to 20,000 people, 30,000 people, see people say, you get nervous? No, not at all. Because I've learned how to flow with my partner. And my confidence is in him, really, to be honest with you. You know, the first time God asked me to write a book, it took a whole year. It was so hard. Now I crank out a book in a few months. Why? Because I've learned how to flow. If you look at what Paul says to the Corinthian church, he said this, we are fellow workers for and with God. Do you see that with God? That's partnership. You see this in the book of Acts when the apostles write a letter in Acts 15, 28. And look what they said. They said, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Do you see the partnership there? They're talking about the way he says it and the way they say it. And they said, it seemed good to both. So this is what we're writing to you. There's a partnership going on here. You see glimpses of this in the Old Testament. You know, one day God makes this statement. He says, should we do what we're planning on doing to Sodom and Gomorrah without first talking to our friend, our partner, Abraham? So he comes down at the terebinth trees and God and Abraham walk to the cliff and they look over the plains of Sodom and God says, Abe, we're thinking about blowing up those two cities over there. What do you think? And Abraham goes, Sodom? And the Lord goes, yeah, yeah, and Gomorrah. What do you think? And, and Abraham and God starts talking about this and God's whole approach was changed because of what his partner said. Amazing. 
Okay, Moses is on the top of the mountain with God in two times, the Bible says, that God changed his mind because of what his partner Moses said. Now, you know, with Moses and Abraham, it's at the terrible trees for Abraham. It's in Moses, it's on the mountain. For us, it's 24 seven because Jesus said he's gonna be continually in you and with you. Do you know Jesus actually said, it's better for you that I go away? Think about this, okay? I mean, he's been with these guys for three and a half years, paid all their bills, saved them from a life-threatening storm, all this stuff, on and on. And he says, guys, I'm telling you the truth. He's never lied to them once in three years, but he's got to preface the statement with, what I'm about to tell you is so mind-blowing, but it's the truth. It's better for you that I go away. Why is it better? He said, because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit's not going to come. Why is it better for us that Jesus went away? You ever hear people say, oh, I wish I could have walked the shores of Galilee with Jesus. I would have asked so many questions. No, you wouldn't have because you've ignored the Holy Spirit. Why would you have asked Jesus those questions? Because Jesus said he's going to be just like me. Exactly like me. No different. So why was it better that Jesus goes away? Because if Jesus didn't go away and you wanted to ask God a question, you had to get on a plane, fly all the way to Tel Aviv. You had to rent a car, drive out to Galilee. Now he would have been really easy to find because there would have been about a million people around him. And you would have had to wait for him to minister to those million people if you give him, you know, 14 hours a day of work because he does have to sleep and he does have to eat. So if you give him 14 hours a day and you give him 60 seconds with every one of those million people, it'd take him 3.26 years to get to you. And when you get there, you better have your question ready because all you got 60 seconds. But you know what's so wonderful is the Holy Spirit can have three million different conversations going on with three million different people in many different languages in every continent at the same time. That's why he said, it's better for you that I go away. Besides, he said, there's things I, can t- I-, I can't tell you because you can't handle them. But when the Holy Spirit comes, you'll be able to handle it. So it's actually possible to better know him better, better, listen to this, than if he was here physically. See, Peter walked with Jesus physically for three and a half years, but Paul knew him by the Spirit. Paul said, henceforth, we don't know anyone after the flesh. We don't even know Jesus after the flesh. We know him by the Spirit. So Paul gets to know Jesus so well that one day Peter writes, you can read it in 2 Peter. Peter says, this guy, Paul, he knows Jesus so well, his letters are blowing me away. Paul came to know Jesus better, and yet Paul never walked with Jesus physically. Why? He depended on the Spirit, whereas Peter was going back to his physical time with Jesus. Do you see the advantage that God has given to us? That's why it's better for us that he went away. I'm preaching myself happy right now. I don't know about you. Are you still with me? Now it goes beyond partnership. It goes to close mutual association. Everybody say close mutual association. Okay, what do I mean by that? Okay, I'm gonna date myself. I'm in high school. You say to me, Paul McCartney. Do you know who I immediately think of? John Lennon, Ringo Starr, George Harrison. They're the Beatles, right? Okay, if you look at me back when I was in high school and you say, Mo and Larry, I go, Curly, baby. Now they tried to put Shemp in there with the Three Stooges, but he's ridiculous. Curly is the man that made the Three Stooges and the Three Stooges. It's Mo, Larry, Curly, right? There's a close mutual association. I remember the first time I was hosting Dr. Ho, Cho. You know, Dr. Cho is the largest church in the world. One million people in Seoul, Korea, right? Well, Dr. Cho likes to play golf. So I got to play golf with him and I've hosted him. I remember the first time I went to pick him up for the service. I go to the hotel and his, his traveling assistant said, now listen, Mr. Bevere, do not talk to Dr. Cho between the hotel and the church. He does not talk to people, okay? I said, okay, you got it. So Dr. Cho gets in my car and when he gets in my car, God gets in my car. Okay, and tears start pouring down my cheek. And finally, I couldn't stand it. I didn't care what they said. I said, Dr. Cho, God is in the car. He goes, I know. I got to know him better later, okay? But I started thinking, you know, this man talks about the Holy Spirit constantly. He spends time with him, prays two hours every day in the Spirit mostly. No wonder the Holy Spirit is closely associated. See, do you wanna know why I show a picture of my family everywhere I go to preach all over the world? I don't care if I'm in Brazil. I don't care if I'm in Russia. I don't care if I'm in, in, in Indonesia. I show a picture of my family. You wanna know why? Because I want you to associate me with Lisa Bevere. And do you know why Lisa shows a picture of me everywhere she goes? Because she wants people to associate her, me with her. Do you know I can name ministers to you? I can name ministers. I'll say their name. They're nationally known. You can't tell me their husband or wife's name. Why? Because they're not closely associated. You see, you got to remember something. We were created in his image. Okay? Do you want to know why I like? I like Pastor Carl. Do you want to know why I like Pastor Carl and Pastor Kanani? You want to know why? Because they're very kind to me. 
They're very honoring. They're very welcoming. Can you imagine if I come in and they just kind of ignore me? You know, I have gone to churches before and I thought, why did they invite me? Because the pastor totally ignores me. He puts me in a different room, won't even talk to me. And I'm like, dude, why did you invite me? Are you just using me? You understand? Okay, so where do you think we got our, okay, so somebody totally ignores you. Are you gonna pursue that person? Are you gonna try to hang around that person? Okay, now listen, to reach out to them, yeah, possibly, but let's say they don't need reaching out to. They just flat out don't like you. Are you really gonna, uh, uh, yeah, you're, I'm gonna be a Christian, I'm gonna pursue them, but let me, let me just put it to you this way. Who are the people you like to flock around? The people that what? Like to be associated with you, right? Well, who do you think we're creating the image of? So if we acknowledge him, he likes being around us. You know, one time I was in a church in Detroit, Michigan. And this church is a church of 5,000 people. Pastor can bench press 545 pounds, okay? So I preach Sunday morning on the Holy Spirit. Sunday night, I'm supposed to have the microphone in 20, 25 minutes. I don't get it for over an hour because the presence of God hit that church so strong. Pastor comes walking up to me, tears coming down his cheek. He says, why is the presence of God so strong in this church? He said, I've never felt it this strong in my entire life. I said, I'll tell you why. We talked about him. See, he likes to associate with people who talk about him. Now you ignore him. You get in the car. You don't talk to him for 20 minutes. And then you wonder why his presence isn't manifesting in your life. Because you're ignoring him. Sure is quiet in this Methodist church. Are you here? <laughs> Are you getting this? All right. So it goes beyond close mutual association. The third, the third word is intimacy. So what the apostle Paul is saying is may the intimate fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Now, what is intimacy? Intimacy can't be developed unless you have fellowship, correct? All right. But it goes further than fellowship. It goes to the thoughts, the secrets, the desires of our heart. Intimacy is the avenue to a deep friendship, correct? Right? So look what Paul says in another translation. He says, may the intimate fellowship, friendship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Did you hear that? May the intimate friendship, you understand? He wants to be an intimate friend with you. Do you understand? This is like the one who put the stars in the universe with his fingers and called them by name. He wants to be a friend. He yearns to be a friend. Okay, and in fact, James, the, the apostle James, he writes about it. He says in James chapter four, verse five, he says, the, in, he says the spirit who dwells. Now notice he says spirit. He, does, he doesn't say Jesus who dwells in you. He says the spirit who dwells in you yearns. Everybody say yearns. yearns. What does yearn mean? It means to long for intensely and consistently. I, that's what I love. I love intense, but I also love consistently. Okay, how many of you know we as human beings, there are times that, <laughs> okay, my wife and I are deeply in love, but there are times that my wife's like, give me my space, like at two in the morning. She, if I wake up Lisa at two in the morning, she's not yearning for me. <laughs> she's like, why you wake me up? I like my sleep, right? The good news is one time I woke up two o'clock in the morning, just a few months ago, and I was so excited about what God was doing. I wanted to talk about it, but I knew if I woke Lisa up, she wouldn't be yearning for me. So I slipped out of bed, went to my office and the Holy Spirit was right there. And we talked till four in the morning. It was so good. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay, he yearns for you. He, listen, yearn intensely and consistently. He longs for you. But notice he says jealously. Everybody say jealously. Jealous. What does jealously mean? What does that mean? Well, do you think Lisa, my wife, would share with me the intimate secrets of her heart if I was pursuing another girl? I'm glad two people know that. <laughs> There's no way. Well, do you think he's going to share the intimate secrets of his heart with you if you're pursuing a relationship with the world? I'm gonna take the whole scripture in context. If you go three verses earlier, I should have it on this PowerPoint. The Bible says, you're seeking a friendship with the world. You're an adulterer. 
What is an adulterer? Adulterer seeks to have a relationship with somebody, violating a relationship covenant with someone else. Now, what is the world? It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. What's pride of life? Let's talk about that one. It's status. So let me put it this way. You know, you want to be on the platform leading worship because you want people to see you. That's status. Don't expect him to be intimate with you. You're an adulterer. Sure is quiet here. <laughs> but if you're, if you're on that platform because you want to serve people, because you love him, then he's going to be intimate. Because remember, he yearns for you. Okay, look, some of you are sitting there and go, how could he yearn for me? I'm such a miserable person. Now you're basing it on your performance and you're not allowing him to change you. Are you with me? Yeah. See, I'm gonna tell you something. I was a miserable person. My, my, my mom cried because of how miserable I was. But I experienced something and that is a living God who changed me. And now my mother loves me. When your own mother cries because of you, that's, that's sad. But he changed me. He really changed me. And that's what he wants to do with you. And, it was, and listen, I, could, I tried changing myself. I couldn't do it. It took him changing me. It's called yielding. You know, you can get in a river and you can try to walk through that river and you're going to have a lot of resistance and problems. But if you just get in over your head and you, and you yield, you float down the river. See, it's not about how much you effort you put in. It's how much you believe and yield. And you cannot base him yearning for you off of your behavior two weeks ago. Because number one, he's the most forgiving being in the whole universe. Number two, if you have desire for him and you say, I don't want the world, I want to be yours. Believe me, he'll work with you. Because he yearns for you. Are you with me? Now, if you go back to what the apostles said in Acts 15, 28, they said it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Now, do you understand that these guys knew him so well, so intimately, that they could represent what he wanted without him speaking? Now, stay with me on this, okay? Okay, they, he, they didn't say the Holy Spirit spoke. They said it seems good. Okay, let me give you an example of this. Last year, Lisa and I are doing a national conference, right? Big national conference. It was her night to speak. The sound man comes walking around during worship with one of these mics, countrymen's. I stopped him. My wife's sitting there worshiping with her eyes closed. I stopped the sound guy. I said, uh-uh, she doesn't want that. She wants a wireless handheld mic. I was able to represent Lisa without interrupting her worship. Why? Because I know her so well. You see, I can be in a room and Lisa can give me one look. There can be a bunch of people in that room and Lisa can give me one look. I can write three pages what she just said. <laughs> now you can be in that room and see that same look and you can't tell anything. Why? Because I know her so well. These guys knew him so well, they could represent him without him speaking. Paul the apostle was the same way. Paul said this, look at this. He said, but in my opinion, I think I'm giving you counsel from God's spirit when I say this. Do you understand? God allowed this to be put in the Bible that Paul was able to say, I'm gonna represent God's spirit, what he wants without him even talking to me about it. And God let this in the Bible. That's amazing, okay? So do you understand? I can represent my wife without her even being here. I can tell you what she likes. Why? Because I know her so well. That's what he wants with you. He wants that kind of relationship with you. Now, in order to be intimate with somebody, how many of you know we got to seek to understand their personality? Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, uh, let me give you an example. Um, earlier this year, they're having our club championship at Flying Horse, and I shot a 67, and I ended up winning the championship. I got a parking spot. I was more excited about the parking spot than the little silly trophy they gave me. I like the parking spot because it's the closest to the clubhouse, okay? So I get this parking spot, right? And I come home. I say, hey, uh, shot a six. They said, dad, how'd you do? You know, everybody's at, in the house. How'd you do? I said, well, I shot a 67. They went, whoa, my boys were like, tell us about every hole you birdied, which, what do you, what, 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 tell us about the putts. And my wife was like, oh, great, great. W what did you and the guy you played golf with, what, what did you talk about? 
Now, do you see the difference? The boys are all into the competition. She's into relationship. You see the different personalities? I, I, my dad, my dad is 94 years old, okay? And he's been married to my mom 66 years this June, okay? Amazing dad. Never saw him drunk a day in his life. Never saw him look at another woman. Never saw him, he never didn't provide for us. And he wasn't a Christian until he was 79. And, and uh, my dad, it was a World War II vet. And that's the problem. He was a World War II vet. In other words, he doesn't talk. Okay, he's a little Italian guy. He doesn't talk very much. So Lisa's my first love, right? And my dad didn't prepare me to be married to a woman. So when I get married to Lisa, I treat her like one of the guys. Okay, you ladies are laughing because you know how ridiculous and much of a train wreck that is, right? So our marriage was miserable for the first four years because I'm treating her like a guy. I'm like, how come you don't get this? It's not logical, right? Now, Peter wrote to us guys and said, hey guys, dwell with them with understanding. Why? Because women have different personality makeups than men. We have different characteristics, right? And if Peter really would have thought it through, he said, you wives dwell with the men with understanding, right? Okay, so how many of you remember when Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit in John, the Gospel of John, 19 times, John 14, 15, 16, he says, he, him, and himself, referring to the Holy Spirit. He, him, and himself. However, the Greeks, if you go back to the original language, have a pronoun that is gender neutral. We don't have that in the English language. Okay, in the English language, we have he, she, it, correct? He is a guy, she is a girl, it is an object or an animal, right? The Greeks have a pronoun that is gender neutral. It can refer to one guy or one girl. That's the pronoun Jesus used all 19 times. Now, if you go back to the Old Testament, the, old, the Hebrew writers had the exact same pronoun. Do you know every time the Holy Spirit is represented in the Old Testament, that's the pronoun that they use is the gender neutral pronoun. However, the Greeks wrote according to form, the Hebrews according to function. Many times the Hebrews, when they assigned an adverb or a verb to that pronoun, it was feminine many times in the Old Testament. Did you hear what I just said? Feminine. Now I am not saying the Holy Spirit is a female. Do not walk out of here and say, I said he's a goddess. Okay, but what I am asking is this, who existed first, God or human beings? Okay, half of you know that? God did, right? Look at Genesis 127, it's amazing. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. So in other words, females were created in the image of God as well as males. So you know what that means? What does that mean? That means there has to be attributes that we ascribe as being feminine that was in God before we were ever created. Because then females couldn't be created in the image of God if there wasn't. So you got the father, that's pretty obvious. You got the son, that's pretty obvious. Who's left? Who could carry the, what we ascribe to being as feminine attributes? The Holy Spirit. Now let me tell you why I believe this to be true. If you look at Ephesians chapter four, it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. It's quite amazing. Notice it doesn't say, do not grieve Jesus. It says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. If you look at the word grieve, it is the Greek word lupiti, which means deep sorrow, deep distress. Comes from the he, it comes from the root word, lupe, which means a pain that can only be experienced between two people who deeply love each other, okay? I can speak harshly to one of my boys and be wrong. And this has happened before, and I've gone back to him 30 minutes later, I said, son, I'm so sorry. I, I never should have spoke to you so harshly. Will you forgive me? My son will go, dad, it's okay, I forgive you. We hug, it's over. Seriously, it's over. But two days later, my wife looks at me and goes, I'm still mad at you for the way you spoke to our son two days ago. <laughs> okay, what did I do? I deeply sorrowed her, right? Can we look at this scripture in context? If you look at it in context, it says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. And then he goes on to talk about rage, anger, and harsh words. He is deeply grieved by the way we talk to one another harshly. Isn't that interesting? Now my sons, they were over it. My wife, because of her personality makeup, her personality traits, she was grieved for a couple days. 
Okay, let me give you another reason why I believe the Holy Spirit carries the attributes of what we ascribe to being feminine. You can talk bad about me. You can even cuss me. I'll forgive you. You talk bad about my wife. You cuss my wife out. You're in huge trouble with me. Look what Jesus said. Jesus said, anyone who speaks a word against the son of man, that's me, Jesus. Excuse me. He was saying, anyone speaks a word against me, Jesus, it's going to be forgiven of him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven to him either this age or the age to come. The father and the son are protective over him like a husband would be protective over his wife, saying, don't you dare speak against him. Why? Because he can be so easily grieved. You still here? In Hawaii, Hawaii, do you know this state has a policy that if a juvenile commits a crime, the first detective they want on the scene is a female detective or a policeman, not a male. And the reason is they've done studies and found that juvenile criminals will respond better to a female police officer than a male. Well, let me just put it to you simply so you get it. When you were a little kid and you got hurt, did you run to mom or did you run to dad? Mom, because she's the comforter of the family. The Holy Spirit is called the comforter by Jesus four times. Why is wisdom referred to as she eight times in the book of Proverbs? He is called the spirit of wisdom. You know what this does? This elevates the value and the worth of women when you understand this. Are you with me? Only religion degrades a woman. Christianity builds a woman because she is an heir together in the grace of life. She's created in the image of God. So is man. The person who best represents the Holy Spirit in the Bible would be King David. Why is that? Because nobody feared David on the battlefield more. He was the most feared man on the battlefield. He was amazing. He was mighty on the battlefield. But if you look at his interpersonal relationships, he's constantly talking about crying. He says to Jonathan, he says to Jonathan, your love's better to me than any of my wives. What guy says that? Okay. So he's very tender and sensitive in relationship, but he's mighty on the battlefield. If you look at the Holy Spirit, he's called the spirit of might because he manifests as the rushing mighty wind. But in interpersonal relationship, he's tender like a woman. This is why many women connect up with him so much easier than men. We got to dwell with him as men with understanding. Women don't. You still with me? If we are going to be effective in life, in reaching this community, then we have to learn how to partner with him. Because if Jesus waited 30 years until he was filled with the spirit before he started his life's work, how much more do we? That's why this is burning so much in my heart. And can I say this? Many people shy away from the Holy Spirit because of the way he was represented in the charismatic move. Can I say something? Nobody can detect weirdness better than a child. True? Right? I mean, you should see my kids. I go to some churches when they were little kids, they go, because the person was weird. But yet kids jumped in the lap of Jesus. And nobody yielded more to the Holy Spirit than Jesus. He got invited to mafia parties. Are you with me? So, unfortunately, in the charismatic move, it wasn't the Holy Spirit who was weird. It was the people who represented him. They would have been weird if they were playing card game. They're just weird. But he's not. That's why I'm calling this book the Holy Spirit, an introduction. I want to introduce him or reintroduce him because he is the most wonderful person on the face of this earth. Did you get something out of this today? I said, did you get something out of this today?
I want to ask every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. <clears throat> Father, in the name of Jesus, I have preached what you've commanded me to preach. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you've given to us today. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to say you could never have a relationship with God like I've just described to you unless you're first a child of God. Let me make this very, very clear. The Bible declares that every single human being that walks the face of this earth was born a slave. Yeah, you were born a slave, so was I. That's why we needed a savior. God came up with a remedy 33 years ago. He sent Jesus, born of a woman, making him 100% man, but he was fathered by the Holy Spirit, making him 100% God. Therefore, he was free from the curse of sin you and I were born in. Jesus walked this earth perfectly for 33 years. And then he did something that was quite amazing. As the only innocent human being that has ever lived, he went to the cross and he bore your judgment and my judgment. He shed his blood as a ransom payment to get us out of slavery. He suffered, he died. They buried him. But three days later, because he himself lived a perfect life, God the Father raised him from the dead. And now we see at the right hand of God and God has made this decree. Listen carefully, listen carefully that any person on this earth that receives Jesus Christ as their Lord, he then becomes their savior. A miracle is done in that moment and that person goes from being a slave to an extraordinary child of God. John, you said the word Lord. What does the word Lord mean? The word Lord means he becomes supreme in authority over our life. It carries the meaning of ownership. This is the best way I know how to describe it. When a woman walks down an aisle of a church with a white dress on and the wedding march is playing, do you know what that woman is saying? She's saying goodbye to every man in the human race except for the one guy that's waiting for her down there. She gives her entire heart, her entire life to that one man. When you give Jesus Christ the lordship of your life, it doesn't make you perfect outwardly the first day, week, year, just like that wife isn't a perfect wife the first day, week, year, even 50 years. It just means you've given your entire heart to him. There are a lot of people that think that all I have to do, listen carefully to what I'm saying. All I have to do is believe Jesus is the son of God. All I have to do is believe he died on a cross. All I have to do is go to church and that's enough to make me a Christian. You can believe Jesus is the son of God. You can go to church. You can know he died on a cross and end up in hell forever. Why? Because you still own your life. You haven't given your entire heart to him. The only way you can become a child of God is to give your entire heart like a woman gives her entire heart to that man when she gets married. If you're sitting in here today and you'd say, John, truth be told, I still own my life. You really don't. You're really a slave of sin. I want to give my life then to Jesus today. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. If that's you and you say, I want to give my life to him completely. I want to know for sure I'm a child of God. Then I want you to raise your hand up high. I want to pray for you this morning. I see the hands going up. Oh my goodness. They're going up all over the building. Too many to count, it's way too many to count. Keep your hands up, don't be, don't be afraid. Let me tell you something, they crucified him nude on a cross. I know the Catholics put a loincloth cloth around his midsection. No, he was crucified naked. They publicly humiliated him and he did that just because of you. And all he says is I want you to do is confess me before men. So don't be ashamed to put your hands up. Just put them up high right now. Don't be ashamed, that's it. I'm so proud of you. There must be about 30 hands up. All right, put your hands back down. I want you, now you say, John, how do I do this? You do it just the way that woman does when she walks up to the altar and gets married to that man. You make your confession. The Bible says with the mouth, one confesses to salvation. With the heart you believe, with the mouth you confess to salvation. So I wanna pray. And I want every person in here that raised their hand to pray this with me. And I want everybody else in this building that's a Christian to pray with those 30 people. Can we say this? Say, God in heaven, forgive me for living life my way, apart from you, my creator. But today, I give my spirit, soul, and body, everything I am, everything I have, to Jesus. Jesus, you are now my Lord. My life is yours. Thank you for changing me now from being a slave of sin to a child of God. Forever and ever, I will serve you as my king. 
And I'm asking you today, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Spirit of God, I welcome you into my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's thank God.